Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session on the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today, Jeffrey Rockwell will take us through near futures for technology on the joys and dangers of predicting the future. Take it away, Jeffrey. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. And uh, thank you for inviting me to, to give this lecture. Uh, I assume the audio is going well and people will look at me funny if something goes off. And of course I have to remember to stay in the same position, which I usually like to move around when I lecture. Uh, close to 50 years ago, the Globe and Mail ran a special on, in, in 1964 on what the world would be like in 2014. I'm just going to read to you some of the things that they said. Imagine a world of schools without teachers of buses without drivers, a world in which men and women selected, select their marriage partner by computer. Imagine a world of push-button farming and garden vegetables 12 feet in diameter, a world of gigantic industrial plants operated by a single man. Now, needless to say, you know, some of these predictions have actually come true. Uh, my children, who are about your age, tell me that uh, selecting marriage partners, or at least dating partners, by computer is more and more common. OkCupid okay uh, has gone, and such sort of dating sites have gone from being uh, sort of unacceptable by anyone who considered themselves normal to being, you know, a standard way in which a standard tool in your repertoire of meeting people. On the other hand, 12-foot vegetables do not seem to be anywhere on the horizon. Uh, a world of schools without teachers, well, we, you know, we have these MOOCs and various computer-assisted learning uh, projects, but somehow teachers don't seem to be going away. Maybe they're getting mediated. Uh, you know, maybe you're sort of wishing I would disappear or something like that. And certainly buses don't yet, uh, aren't, we don't have buses without drivers, but Google has a project which is now, I think, licensed, they are now licensed in California. So we see 50 years ago, a newspaper compiling a special report on what the future would be like and getting some things right and some things wrong. And that's really the topic of my presentation today. I want to talk about what we're doing when we predict the future. I want to talk about some histories of prediction. I want to look at, at how people have, uh, what people have predicted will happen to reading machines. And uh, secondly, I want to look at very briefly at virtual reality. And then I want to sort of look at some of the current warnings and predictions around technology, especially around computing. And finally, I want to end on a few words on the philosophy of technology. Uh, my goal is not to make, you, uh, to make you distrust all prediction or to stop prediction, because I actually think prediction is a very human, uh, is a very human practice. Uh, my goal is more to make you a little bit skeptical about the truths of prediction and to make you critical of, of where predictors are coming from, where future hype is coming from and where it's going, including being critical of your own ability to predict the future. So what are we doing when we predict the future? Well, <clears throat> Herbert Simon, who is really one of the, the uh, fathers of, of computing, uh, including, in some ways, one of the fathers of artificial intelligence, uh, he had this to say, whenever we try to forecast the future course of events, economic, social, or technical, we inevitably have to do so on the basis of things which have happened in the past and with which we are familiar. We forecast by analogy. Another word that some get, sometimes get used is that we forecast by trajectory. We look at the past and we sort of plot some points, if I was going to sort of give it a visual sense, we sort, of, we sort of go, well, this happened back then, then this happened, then this happened, and I can sort of see a line here, and if I project out 10, 20, 50 years from now, we should have vegetables that are 12 feet in diameter. Because, uh, you know, and to be honest, have you guys seen the strawberries in the supermarkets recently? Like, when I was a kid, strawberries were really small, and now they have these Franken strawberries, which are, have about as much taste in the big strawberries. So you can, you can see how somebody sort of, go, seeing how the size of strawberries gets bigger and bigger, sort of goes, well, you know, 50 years from now, I'm going to have strawberries that are a foot big uh, and still tasteless. Uh, a philosopher, David Hume, uh, made a point, a sort of uh, uh, epistemological point, 
which a lot of people forget. And his point was, we have no proof, no proof that the future will resemble the present or the past. Everything that we, you know, even something as simple as Jeffrey's wallet is going to drop on the table when he lets go. I bet you're all sitting there going, when he lets go, yeah, it's going to drop. It's going to hit the table. Maybe it'll bounce. Maybe Rockwell will, <clears throat> you know, make a fool of himself or something like that. But you're all, I bet, 100% convinced that it will drop. And yet, your knowledge that it is going to drop is based essentially on habit. You have seen things drop when, they are, when somebody lets go of them. None of you have yet been into space. They always seem to drop. In the few occasions when they don't drop, there's probably a magic trick, and then you start looking for the wire or something like that. David Hume pointed out that we have nothing in the neighborhood of logical proof that something will act the way it acted before. All we have is a series of data points in the past, and we predict the future, even things as trivial as a dropping wallet. We predict the future based on the fact that we assume it is going to be similar to the past, that it will replicate the same sort of mechanisms. And by and large, we're right. Common sense says that's the best thing to do because, you know, statistically, you've always been right when you predicted that things would drop. But proof, we don't have in the sense of, of some, something approximating the sort of logical proof of, uh, uh, that philosophers would look for. A very interesting book, if you you know, want a sort of a good popular read about, uh, about prediction of the future, is the book Future Hype. In fact, I think, uh, I think an earlier version of this lecture was called Future Hype. And this is a book in which uh, the author looks at how predictions, uh, in some ways, looks at the uh, patterns of predictions. You could say he makes a prediction about predictions. And he does a couple of things. He talks about uh, Amara's law. And Amara's law is that we almost always overestimate short-term changes and underestimate long-term changes. We almost, uh, we as humans, are fascinated by what's up close and what we, we see happening. And so we tend, to, we tend to extrapolate from that. And we don't see the large uh, long-term statistical changes. You could say, for example, that this, this might, for example, explain why nobody gets too worked up about climate change. That's a long-term, slow uh, set of changes with all sorts of complicated statistical things. But nobody is tripped over climate change. Whereas people will get very worked up, you know, there's one robbery in their neighborhood and all of a sudden the crime rates have rocketed. The second thing he says is there are um, often unintended consequences to new technologies. It's almost always that the people who develop the new technologies, especially what get often called disruptive technologies, are developing them, predicting and aiming their agenda is one thing, and the technologies have an unpredictable effect. Uh, another way to put this is the people who develop the technologies often get the prediction about what these technologies are going to do wrong, uh, or at least in the case of very disruptive ones. Now, there's something sort of circular about that argument because you could say, you know, there's all sorts of scientists and technologists who get it right. You know, they go, well, I've got this new... Uh, patented device that does X, I bring it on the market, it's going to sell well, and it does sell well, or it doesn't, or whatever. Another thing that people do, and, and I have a slide following this, which makes a sort of visual sense of this, is that often change is not linear. It's, it, it, uh, it goes through a sort of curve, and people make the assumption when they're in the riser of the curve that this is going to go exponential. And this is where I think most future hype comes from people going, oh my God, something's changing very quickly, it will keep on changing very quickly. And the evidence is no, it, that's not how it works. Almost every technology goes through a period of rapid change and then it plateaus. Just about everything that people got worked up about 100 years ago, 50 years ago, at some point or another stabilized. Um, but when you're in the elbow of change, you tend to think that the whole thing is gonna skyrocket. Finally, and of course something that's very interesting to me as, a, as somebody who's interested in media, is a lot of what's happening with prediction is around uh, media anxieties, media fascinations with prediction. Prediction is not 
some sort of science where we have a bunch of people sitting sort of objectively to one side going, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen in the future. The predictors often have a stake in the prediction. And one of the biggest groups of people who make money off prediction is the media. And they make a lot of money off technology prediction. Just open up any computer magazine, and the, often the magazine is not really about what happens now or what's working now. It's about the near future, what's almost here. Uh, how many of you have read an article recently about the PS4? Now, I'm willing to bet none of you have a PS4. There's a small number of people who have PS4s. But you are getting, you're fascinated by, and the media is feeding you, and in some sense making money off your interest in the near future, this new generation of consoles that are coming out. And if you're a gamer, and you're like me, you know, the PS4, Xbox One, uh, is it Xbox One? No, it's, yeah, Xbox One. Uh, you know, which one am I gonna buy? Should I wait, should I buy it now? You know, I really, I don't know about you guys, I'm a big fan of the Killzone series. And, you know, the, one of the opening games for the PS4 is the new Killzone. It looks beautiful. Uh, am I willing to spend $600 for the launch version of the PS4? With, uh, I don't know. Or do I wait after Christmas? You know, after Christmas, I have to work again. So, this is, my point is, is that, the, the, that we as consumers of news love to be reading about these near futures and the media feeds it to us and that to some extent creates a dynamic which reinforces the overestimation of short-term change. So here's that curve that I was telling you about. Most technologies go through a phase of fermentation, then there's a sort of period of explosive growth and change, and then there's a period of stagnation or a plateau. Uh, you know, take something like rocket science. You know, we're actually further behind than they were in 69, they landed on the moon. We cannot land on the moon right now. We don't have the, we don't have the doodads and toys. We've, we've, in some sense, we could restart a moon launch program and get to the point where we could put humans on the moon, on the moon. but it would probably take the same sort of investment it took back in the 60s when Kennedy said, you know, we are gonna land, we're gonna put a foot on the moon. Take cars. Uh, you guys are too young. You guys are of the generation. Many of you probably had take no pride in having a driver's license and driving. In fact, cars for your generation have become sort of symbols of overconsumption and pollution. But my father's generation, cars were the hottest new technology. And cars were going to become everything. And then, of course, helicopters were going to take over from cars. And instead of having the suburban car, you were going to have the suburban helicopter. And transportation was the cool technology. Again, to some extent, that is stagnated. Not to say that cars don't change and the technologies in cars don't change. But there isn't the same hype around cars that there used to be. It's now around the digital. It's around computing. In fact, I think it's around mobile computing. So I now want to take you back in time. And I want to show you a, a sort of give you a little history of uh, predictions and discussion about the technology of reading. This is something that you guys are deeply invested in. You don't think it's cool, you don't think it's interesting, and yet the fact that you guys are medical students means that you have done an amazing amount of reading and are going to do even more reading of various sorts. And you're probably, you probably know instinctively that the technologies of reading are going to be very important to your everyday life, whether you're reading charts, whether you're you know, catching up on the literature, whatever it is. You, in fact, two of you have computers open and are probably ignoring the lecture and reading something completely different about the PS4 and whether or not, you know, what is Killzone? Killzone? I missed that game. You know, it's from a Dutch company, by the way. So, Reading machines. Uh, take you back to the time of Plato. In Plato's Phaedrus, which if any of you ever get like a free week and want to read something completely, uh, well, something that, it, you know, a classic text, you should, and if you're sitting there having one of these philosophical moments, read the Phaedrus. It's one of the greatest works of philosophy of all time. Anyway, in the Phaedrus, there is a remarkably interesting and prescient short mini dialogue. The Phaedrus itself is a dialogue between Socrates and Phaedrus. And then within that, Socrates tells the story of a little mini dialogue. And it's, it's probably the first text about the philosophy of technology. And in that mini story, he talks about the invention of writing. And he talks about um, 
uh, he talks about the encounter between Thoth, uh, who is in some sense a, uh, he's an inventor type, and, uh, and Thamos, who is a legislator, a philosopher king. And uh, Thoth says, you know, this writing, which is this new technology he's just developed, will make Egyptians wiser and give them better memories. It is a specific both for the memory and for the wit. And Thamos, the, you know, the old cynical legislature uh, king type says, oh, most ingenious Thoth, the parent, of an invent, uh, parent or inventor of an art is not always the best judge of the utility or inutility of his own inventions to the users of them. And in this instance, you who are the father of letters from a paternal love of your own children have been led to attribute to them a quality which they cannot have. For this discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls. So what's happening in this encounter? There's, a, there's all sorts of cool layers. Uh, this is, you know, like all of Plato is it's sort of like an onion, and there's layers and layers of stuff going on here. But one of the things that's happening is that Socrates is saying uh, inventors are not always the best judges about what's gonna, uh, how their technologies are going to be used. And remember, in 3rd, 4th century B.C. Athens, actually this because, you know, Plato's 3rd century B.C., but he's sort of talking about a semi-mythical past, let's say four or 500 years before the, uh, the Common Era. At that time, writing was a new technology, and it was very, you know, it was, it was not a new technology in the sense of a doodad, though there were all sorts of doodads associated with it, uh, but it's a new technology in the sense that it was something that they were aware at least in the time of Plato, they were aware that this could change the way we do thinking. Now, to our, to our sort of literate minds, it's sort of, well, just how different would it have been before writing came along? But in fact, it was very different. All education in the time of orality was memorization. The moment you get writing, as uh, Thoth the inventor says, you know, that should free up our memories. We should be able to externalize our memories, put all of our thoughts, all those stories, all those things, those memoranda, you know, the, the accounting books and stuff like that. We should be able to put them down on, on papyrus or clay tablets or whatever like that. And that should make us, it should improve our memory. And of course, Thamos is saying, well, that might not be the effect. And in some ways, Thamos is right. We have far worse memories now in the sense of we, we, we do not memorize the amount of stuff that people even up into the 19th century memorized. Your parents probably went to school and memorized poetry. Have you ever memorized anything? Have you, you know, maybe you had a, the one teacher who made you memorize something for a re rhetoric contest or something like that. But in Plato's time, memorization was, if you wanted to be an educated person, you had to memorize because there's no stuff that you could write it down. There's no iPads and something like that. So it's a very interesting story, and I'm, I'm not going to unpack some of the other stuff, but you can see already 2,000 years ago, people are thinking about what is the effect of technology? Who knows what, you know, how do predictions work? Who's the best predictor? Jumping ahead 1,500, 800 years, here's one of the first uh, attempts to sort of uh, fantastic attempts to come up with an alternative uh, writing technology. I've sort of skipped over the invention of the, uh, of the book, which is itself very interesting, because remember in Greco-Roman times, they, they used scrolls, and the, and the codex, or the, the book with two covers and something like that was a cool invention. But anyway, this one sort of appealed to me because I could find a picture about it, and this is Romelli's. This is one of uh, Romelli's sort of imaginative uh, inventions. Uh, this was probably not built in his time, but it is buildable because other people have since then built uh, versions of this or taken this as a model. And the idea was to build a reading machine that allowed somebody, a researcher, a student like you, to have access to a whole mess of books at once. And you could rapidly rotate that wheel and flip the pages and so on like that. And he even provides a sort of, on the right there, you see a sort of gearing mechanism that would make this work. Uh, note that he says, this would be very useful and convenient for anyone who takes pleasure in study. I hope you guys still take pleasure in study. I, you know, I, I haven't been a medical student, uh, but I sometimes hear that you, you, it's sort of a forced march and you don't get a lot of pleasure. But, but this class should at least be a moment of pleasure, um, especially those who are indisposed and tormented by gout. 
Uh, the gout part is that, you know, if you have this nice big reading wheel thing, you don't have to get up off your bottom and go find a book in the library or wherever it is, which, which sounds sort of funny now, but I bet a lot of you are very keen on getting as much on your laptop or accessible over the internet in one place as possible. The idea of minimizing the travel to get to information is still something that is very important now because, uh, uh, again, you, you sort of, my generation, I, you know, every time I wanted a new book, I had to physically go down to the library. Often I had to order it. It would be weeks before it came. Now I can get the electronic copy. If not a legal one, I can try to find a graduate student who has access to whatever these little underground rivers of PDFs are. Jumping ahead, H.G. Wells, the science fiction uh, author, also. He was a sort of techno-utopian, and he was fascinated by microfilm. He's not the only one. Microfilm at its, in his time uh, seemed to be in a massive step forward in, the minute, in, the, in, the, in our capacity to store information. You know, think about it. You know, a book of a certain size all of a sudden can be boiled down to a tiny little film thing. It can be projected, can be easily uh, copied and stuff like that. And here, you, in this quote, you see that H.G. Wells not only does he think that, is it, that it is possible to, to gather and index all human knowledge, it's not enough to gather it. If you gather it, nobody's going to find what they want. You, you need to be able to index it. But then he thinks if we can do this, it will foreshadow a real intellectual unification of our race. This is not, he's not the first or the last person to make this point. Over and over again, the techno-utopians will say, you know, any day now we are going to have a new knowledge technology, and when everybody knows everything, then all of a sudden we'll become peaceful and start fighting each other. Uh, and, you know, you're going to hear that, you're going to hear that story in various forms over and over again. It's often uh, presented to you by companies coming out of Silicon Valley because they want to sort of cloak themselves with, it's not just that they're selling you some cool piece of technology, but they're also going to make the world safer for democracy. And, uh, you know, in some ways, some of what's going on with the whole Snowden leaks is a debate about, well, you know, does the NSA having every piece of information that travels over the, the internet uh, in one enormous database that they can search, will that really make life safer for democracy and make us all peaceful and something like that? Uh, here you can see another example of people imagining uh, reading technologies using microfilm. Uh, I bet you guys haven't thought about, have any of you seen microfilm or used a microfiche reader? Yeah, there's a couple of, I'm glad to see some people. They, if you go to the library, they still have them because some, some materials, uh, all sorts of newspapers were scanned to microfiche and then destroyed, and all we have is the microfiche because nobody thought that anything better would come along after the microfiche. Um, but that's a separate issue. Um, this is the Memex. Uh, this this uh, was another imaginary technology in the sense that it was never built, but one of the single most influential imaginary technologies of all time. Uh, Vannevar Bush, who was Roosevelt's science advisor, he was also a, a very important scientist, uh, technologist at MIT, uh, wrote an article at the end of World War II called, for the Atlantic Monthly, called As We May Think, in which he essentially set out to answer the question, you know, we, the United States, we have leveraged all sorts of uh, technology to win the war. How can we leverage and use technology and science in peace? And his answer is, well, we can use it to think better. Remember this old thinking thing? It goes back to Plato. This is a recurring theme, you know, new technology. We're going to think better, and we're going to become wiser, and the world's going to become more democratic, and that sort of stuff. Anyway, he proposes a whole series of technologies. It's a fascinating read. The Atlantic Monthly is put up for free online if you want to skim it. Just look at some of the different uh, vocoders and stuff like that. But the Memex is this device that has, it has two screens, it has a series of microfiche ro uh, microfilm rolls, that, uh, and then a series of buttons that allow you to advance from one place to another. And here's the part that is really innovative and that's had a profound influence. He imagined that what scholars might do or researchers might do is they might be reading one thing and then they see a link to something else and they might want to establish a link between something they're reading one place to somewhere else. 
and hard code that. And then if they establish a series of links, they'd have a path and they might want to present that, give that path to somebody else who has the same stuff. And this, this, this sort of uh, device was designed to support that time of, oh, and I should mention on the left there is actually a scanner, so you could add new information to this collection of pages that you begin to link. Now, does that sound familiar to you? Pages that are linked? From this essay, a series of, you know, I can show you a direct sort of link from this to hypertext, because one of the people that reads this is, is Theodore Nelson. He, he theorizes, he coins the word hypertext, and he's the one who gets the idea of, well, no, we don't build this associative web of information. We don't build it with microfilm. Computers are the way to go. So he coins the word hypertext, and he begins building some technologies. Other people build much better technologies, and uh, the web is built on two protocols, HTML, hypertext, trans, uh, hypertext markup language, and HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol. So, so you, this is actually an idea that, uh, uh, in some ways, an idea for how knowledge might be managed, which uh, Vannevar Bush wasn't so much predicting, but he did get it right. And what he got right, in my mind, is the shift from the index as a way of getting at information to the web. The indexes are hierarchical, they give you one way in. Webs allowed multiple paths through and allowed different people to layer different, different paths. Um, here's another uh, very influential in the States, uh, Dr. Spillhaus, uh, working with various artists, produced, and he was dean at the University of Minnesota's Institute for Technology. He produced for decades a comic book series on science and technology that probably had more effect on people's imagination in the 60s and so on like that. And here you see him going, researchers thousands of miles away may consult books in the Library of Congress or the British Museum. But what's cool is that he is using technologies of the time and recombining them. Again, a little bit like Vannevar Bush, he's, he, 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 you know, he doesn't get the computer part right, what he gets, but he gets some of the sort of, he gets some of the purposes right, he just uses existing technology. So you have a sort of CB radio, you have television, you have a, a rat in a cage, very important technology in the good old days. Uh, did you guys all go through like intro psych with the rats in the cage and so on, or they've gotten rid of that? In my day, they used to kill thousands of rats at the University of Toronto because all intro psych students had to, had to, do, uh, had to train rats to hit buttons and so on like that. But uh, rats were an important uh, scientific technology. Oh, and we got the microscope over there, all the symbols of, of science and technology. I'm going to sort of zip along here and end you up with uh, this, e-books and iBooks, because that's where we are, are now. But what I, what I hope I've taken you through is a sort of uh, a series of moments in the history of a very important type of technology, reading and information technology, and how people have imagined it. And uh, some of the things that I draw, some of the lessons I draw from this is that often these futures reflect the technology of the time and sort of project a recombination of it. Vannevar Bush is, Imagining microfilm, so is H.G. Wells. Um, later on, we see television and CB radio. Uh, with Ramelli, we saw wood and gears. You know, mechanical engineering was just taking off and so on like that. Another thing that's very interesting is when you look at a prediction, ask yourself, what problem do they think it is solving? A well-known Princeton uh, sort of historian of computer science has said, when we, when we look at the history of computing, we shouldn't sort of judge what they were saying then by our standards. We should ask ourselves, what was their agenda? What did they think they were going to do in their own words? What did they say this technology was going to solve? So for example, Ramelli is worried about gout. Uh, Vannevar Bush is worried about actually the same problem that goes back to the time of Plato and we still worry about in spades, which is too much information. In fact, if there's one problem that everybody thinks is a serious problem and that technology will save, it's the problem of too much information. Um, uh, Clay Shirky has a very funny thing that you can see on the web where he says, you know, if you ever want to convince an editor 
to authorize you, to authorize an article that you're writing. Just say, you know, I'm going to talk about a technology that's going to solve the, pro the problem of too much information. Because it, we all feel it. And, uh, but it doesn't go away. And there's something to be said about that, too. And, and then we have uh, the idea of the access to remote information. And finally, problems of education and peace. It's very common to then extrapolate, well, if we can solve the problem of information, then that will somehow inform people are more peaceful, more democratic, and so on and so on. And that in itself is a sort of social extrapolation which doesn't entirely fa uh, uh, follow. So I, I think in terms of time, in order to have some time for questions, I'm going to move on a little bit quicker. The second technology I wanted to take you through was virtual reality. Have any of you seen Lawnmower Man? Hey, I like you. <laughs> you and I have probably, you know, watched and read the same books. Uh, but you're younger. No. Um, Lawnmower Man is one, is a, uh, a Pierce Brosnan stars in it. It, uh, you know, from a cinema, from a sort of cinema studies point of view, it's a horrid film. But from a technology point of view, it's fascinating because the movie in 1992, uh, they, they showed in the movie the absolute current virtual reality technology of the time. And they were showing real devices that were being developed in research labs to do virtual technology. And then they were extrapolating from them. Uh, and it, so it's a sort of science, it's a near science fiction movie, something about it, you know, in its time, it's about what could happen five years from 1992, you know, based on the technology we have already. Uh, and it's, uh, it sort of takes the way all science fiction often does, it sort of takes this new technology, virtual reality, and, and you know, the early 90s was when they were getting the first sort of head-mounted parallax systems that allowed you to see in stereo, and that's sort of what the guy has on his head there. Uh, and uh, they, were, they were extrapolating and they were imagining a future where, in some sense, we all get sucked into a virtual reality. The problem is, is that, uh, and you know, so that was a movie, but, but I was working in the field of new media and everybody was predicting that virtual reality was the next big important thing. Uh, some of you are gamers, may remember Nintendo. Do you remember they, they, they did the, what was it called, the Game Boy? V Virtual Boy, you know, they, they even poured money. That was the last, uh, that was Gunpei, Gunpei Yokoi's, you know, last major project. He was the inventor of Game and & Watch and uh, uh, the Game Boy and so on like that. That was, his, that was his big failure, actually, the Virtual Boy. So all sorts of people were investing in virtual reality, and it didn't happen. Everyone was sure that this was going to happen. So here's my theory about what was going on, is that people were looking at interface, and you have to remember, you know, starting with the desktop publishing revolution in 1986, when Apple comes out with, a, with the uh, laser printer and PageMaker comes out, people become aware of interface as, as a technology. Now, you know, interface doesn't really exist. You know, there are screens and mice and keyboards, but interface as a, as a cognitive technology, of course it exists. And all sorts of money was being poured into developing more and more efficient interfaces. And people sort of notice the history of the evolution of interfaces, and they sort of go, well, you know, with the ENIAC, you had to use a plug board. If you wanted to program it, it was really tedious, and you, you essentially rewire the computer. Uh, and then we begin to get these one-dimensional dialogical um, sort of interfaces. If any of you ever worked on a Unix command line or MS-DOS or something like that, you get these, um, you know, it's an interface where you, where you essentially are typing and it's a transcript of a conversation between you and the computer. And that's really, in many ways, one-dimensional. Uh, and then the Macintosh comes along. Of course, we all know the Macintosh was actually based on previous work at Xerox. But we get a two-dimensional interface. We get a, a truly graphical interface. What's the ob obvious next step? Three dimensions. We're going to dive into the computer and be able to swim around and look around and see in stereo and something like that. And it doesn't happen. Uh, here you can see an example of... Uh, some of the hype around virtual reality. Uh, Jaron Lanier was one of the sort of cool guys out of MIT. I'm not sure if he was actually at MIT, but one of the cool guys who was associated with uh, uh, virtual reality. 
you'll start to be able to experience virtual reality within a few years. There will be virtual reality rooms at universities and students can, that students can do projects in. Well, in some sense, Second Life is there. That sort of is virtual reality, but nobody's excited about this. Nobody thinks that this is the way to go. So what happened? Well, what happened is rather than us jumping into the computer, the computer got really small and jumped into us. You know, we have computers in our bodies. We can put them in our pockets. It was a sort of, uh, instead of us adapting to the computer, the computer adapted to us. Uh, so that's my second example. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to my sort of warnings and predictions now. I'm going to skip these ones. And this is, so now you get, you know, having sat there and been skeptical of other people's predictions, it's only fair that I do what everybody else does and give you my own predictions so that you have something to laugh at me about in, in five years. Uh, my first thing, my first prediction, and this is one that I am certainly not the first and won't be the last, and all sorts of people are banging this drum, especially at IBM, is the next big thing is big data and the ability to draw knowledge through analytics, mostly statistical processes on um, big data. Google is a big, uh, you know, if you ever use something like Google Translate or just Google the search engine, you're benefiting from massive amounts of data and various statistical techniques that try to infer what it is that you want out of that data. Um, there's an interesting paper by Google about how you know, the whole knowledge representation AI route is wrong and the big data route is the way to go. And there seems to be a sort of shift away from traditional 70s, 80s AI towards uh, these sort of big data models. If you've been following the news, you know that the NSA has poured billions of dollars into very, very big data for the purposes of predictive counterterrorism. They think if they get enough data, they can uh, actually begin to target terrorists, predict terrorists, or in some cases target uh, terrorist-like uh, activities, and then be able to backtrack and do the intelligence work much faster than they would in the old human days. There's a certain debate about that too. The second thing I think is important is gamification. Uh, it used to be that kids stopped playing games somewhere around 18, something happened. Now people, like myself, are continuing to play games. Games have become very important to our culture. If you will, the 60s and 70s were the era of television. Now in the 80s with the NES, we entered the, you know, the era of games. And gamification is trickling down into everything. Um, I'm going to make a crazy prediction and say, you know, in 10 years, the medical curriculum will involve all sorts of gamification components where you are being asked to learn through pseudo competition and leaderboards and little stars and so on like that. You remember when you were in elementary school and the scratch and stiff uh, stickers, you know, the first one who finishes his reading assignment gets two scratch and sniffs and you would, ah, my God, and you would be so motivated for a scratch and sniff sticker. <clears throat> I was a teacher for a while and uh, it only works so far. Interfaces. It used to be, used to be, there, there's been a certain amount of stability to interfaces that we, uh, and then things are beginning to change very rapidly and it ties to physical computing. I've got some pictures to show you here. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time in Japan. This is a, uh, this is a photo booth, they're very big in Japan, and they have all sorts of really fabulous touch interfaces where, you know, groups of people, you, you, you go to the photo booth, you get a bunch of pictures taken, then you go in, they have these fabulous algorithms that make your eyes bigger and your skin wider, and they do very strange things to Caucasian males, but, but if you're a Japanese female, they, they improve your looks dramatically. But look at this, this is a sort of social interface where two or three people, after having their pictures taken, begin to sort of uh, annotate that and so on like that. And then you print out these stickers and the stickers become a sort of, sort of form of social capital in, in among Japanese youth. Here's a racing game and everyone sits around the table and these horses go charging along. It's semi-physical, semi-digital. Uh, here's a large fishing game. Again, you sit around it. Think of the effect of free screens. The idea that the screen is this big and has to sit in a sort of sacred spot, you guys have probably noticed how screens are, screens are proliferating. You get on buses now and screens are all over the place. What happens when a screen is as cheap as paint 
and we can put it all over the place. What sort of interfaces can we start having then? Um, here are, uh, this is a, a very popular game in the Japanese arcades now that uses cards. The cards are sensed by the, the board, you place the cards down, this is, this is sort of about warring states, and you move the cards around and it senses it and that's moving your pieces. We're beginning to see commercial use of this idea of smart, uh, smart sensing technology where you move physical tokens and it changes things in, in a virtual world. This is a coin pusher game from Nintendo. It's, it's got a sort of Mario theme. Uh, coin pushers are very old. There's an old carny type of game where you have this, you have this moving arm that is in a whole mess of coins and you're trying to drop in a coin that will then push a whole mess off. So you, you pay coins in and you're trying to get more coins than you paid in. But this has all sorts of other bells and whistles like a, you know, a science museum sort of extravaganza of little balls and stuff like that that go rolling all over the place. Um, Pachinko, I could talk for hours about Pachinko. These are pods. If any of you have ever played any Gundam games, this is a Gundam pod game where you, you get in it. So these little mini virtual realities and stuff like that. Uh, horse racing games where you have, you know, banks of uh, stations and stuff like that. All of that connects to physical computing. Uh, I'm going to leap ahead here to uh, something I just saw the other day that we are now, it, it has become possible to start building, even if you don't have a lot of money, to start building your own cool little interfaces. With things like Arduinos and lily pads, you guys with like a hundred bucks can start building musical toys, different interfaces. This is one from the MIT Tangible Media Lab. Boy, does it not project well. But anyway, uh, what it is, is imagine a whole mess of wooden pegs on actuators. So the thing on the right there shows you that. And then imagine that this is all programmable so that someone in a remote site can move their hands and the world sort of pushes up and you can in effect create texture, but deep texture, it's not little, it's not like braille. It's you can actually roll a ball around or model a building or something like that. So we're beginning to see, uh, we're beginning to see the traditional screen, keyboard, mouse, or screen and touch screen type of interface. We're seeing it break down as people start exploring and being able to cheaply build all sorts of alternative interfaces. So that's my last, uh, my last sort of uh, prediction that, uh, and which now leads me to the, uh, the boring stuff, which is philosophy of technology. And I want to leave you with um, a couple of uh, ideas from the philosophy of technology. The first one is that, uh, the first one uh, comes from Martin Heidegger and Jacques Ellul. And it's that technologies um, are always part of systems. That we tend to understand technologies in the context of systems. If you take something like a road sign, a road sign by itself doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, like park here. It makes sense in terms of a system where there are cars, there are roads, there's parking. That system is tied to sort of political and economic systems because you might get fined if you park in the wrong spot and so on like that. And then those systems only make sense in terms of what you want to do. So at the end of the day, when we're thinking about technology, we often have to get down to what is your agenda? Your agenda right now is to make it through this class, get a good grade, get your, your medical degree, except for the guy who's the guest. Are you also a medical student or? No, okay, so they, we, we got three people who wanna you know, become doctors. If you think about it, when you have that little moment where you go, what am I doing in my life? You probably have an agenda of greater or less specificity, but it sort of goes, you know, survive the class, make it to Christmas, get decent grades, you know, get, uh, you know, get my, my medical degree, you know, have, you know, maybe meet someone with whom I could have a nice relationship over a certain amount of time. Uh, maybe I want to have children. Uh, you know, and it gets a little vague as it goes on. But my point is, is that your use of technology often links in most everyday cases to these projections into the future about what you're going to be and do. A simple example is doorknobs. Doorknobs are a very important technology. Imagine if they all stopped working one day. Uh, you know, so why do you use a, t a doorknob? You use a doorknob to get out of a room. 
Why do you want to get out of a room? Because you want to go somewhere else. So the technology is always tied to a set of sort of what you want to do next. And so that's part one of Heidegger's sort of insights. It seems sort of obvious, but uh, it, uh, it, Heidegger does a much better job than I do of making it interesting. Actually, he does a worse job than I do, but, but he's very interesting when you think about it. Um, Jacques Ellul is interesting because he points out that the, 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 the most important technologies out there, the ones that really affect us, are the technologies we use to manage ourselves. Bureaucracy is the first and most important and is still probably the technology that makes the most difference in our lives. We started developing ways of managing people and they involve things like your names. You know, you think it's normal to have a first name and a family name. That is not normal. That was an invention by Western technology. If you come from the Arab world, your name is not Jeffrey Rockwell. It's Jeffrey, son of Peter, son of Norman, son of whatever it is. Even now, there's all sorts of big people come from Japan. In Japan, your family or clan name comes first. You're not, you're Rockwell Jeffrey, not Jeffrey Rockwell. Well, bureaucracy standardized us put us into certain sort of, they sort of say, okay, well, we need to manage you, so we have to know who's there, so we need names, and then we need numbers, like social insurance numbers. Uh, we need to have offices where people go to find you, get a driver's license, and so on, so on, and so on. And so Jacques Ellul makes the point of, you know, if we're gonna be serious about understanding technology and predicting it, we need to look at the technologies we use to manage ourselves. This other stuff is, to a certain extent, toys. This is the icing, the fluff. And then he goes on and he points out that the really big change is the change that happened somewhere in the 19th century when uh, we began to stop having alternatives to a discourse of technology. Uh, in the, you know, there's still people around today, this isn't an absolute thing, but, but nowadays, almost all of our language and discussions is around efficiency. And efficiency is the discourse of technology, how to do things better how to cure cancer, how to cure cancer more, how to you know, lose weight, how to get from A to B faster, how to you know, save the climate. It's all about efficiency. That's a discourse of technology. What's missing in that is what is this all for? And Alul's point is that you know, we have actually stopped asking those questions. There was a time when, you know, in some ways, the primary ideological discourse was that of religion. And everything was about, you know, making it to heaven and something like that. I'm simplifying dramatically. But somewhere in the 19th century, especially in Europe and so on like that, there was a shift from having a variety of different discourses to essentially a discourse of technology and everybody else has to pile on. I'm going to leave it right there so you have some chance to tell me I'm wrong and ask questions. Thank you. So has this thing been taking pictures of me when I, whenever I do? I was trying to move dramatically there so that it would uh, take interesting pictures. I'm, I'm sure you'll be very satisfied with the uh, photographic outcome. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious as to if you've seen uh, views or technologies coming about for developing algorithms for predicting the future, like the science fiction Isaac Asimov put in the, the whole series where we can predict the future perfectly in 20 years. Um, do I see algorithms for predicting the future? No. Um, now, why do, why do I not see that? I think, so one of, the, one, of the, one of the interesting feedback loops that happens is that the moment you have some prediction about the future, if it gains currency, uh, then in some sense it changes the, the very people who are thinking about the future. When, you know, if, they, if they're aware of a prediction about the future, then it changes whether or not they're going to behave in the way that the prediction expected them to behave such that the prediction would be true. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So let's say I tell you right now, I know for sure that in two seconds you're going to stand up and walk out that door. Now suppose for a second that I was actually right. The moment you hear me tell you that, it's going to change your behavior. The moment it changes your behavior, we get a feedback loop such that the conditions under which I made the prediction are no longer true. Because I made the predictions under the condition where you did not know that I thought you were going to run out the door and screaming, ah, I can't stand it. 
so you get this, this, this feedback loop. And you know, this was you know, one of the great sort of moments in, in sort of thinking about technology was cybernetics, which was about feedback loops. And this was one of the really interesting things they were trying to figure out was how to create, because humans are very good at, at dealing with feedback, uh, where, where when I do something, it changes the world in such a way that I have to change what I'm doing to the world in order to adapt to my changing the world. So I think I think the feedback loops are going to be what are going to be what are going to throw this off. Okay, that's working very well for the micro, but what about the macro? Where you have the the smaller implications of what you just said go away because you have a group of people, a larger group of people that will do, will get up in 2 seconds and walk. So, well, I'll give you an example. The Club of Rome predicted in I don't know, 1969, they predicted that we were going to exhaust our food supplies, that population growth was, was the single most important problem. So that was a macro scale prediction. Now, what's interesting about the Asimov is that the person doing the predicting did not tell the world about their predictions. They just planned a, a weird cultish society that would somehow uh, deal with it. Uh, we could have a conversation about the, about the cultish societies out there, like the, the ones that poison, you know, release poison gas in, 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 in the Tokyo subway station. They were, a, they were a cult that believed that they knew something about the future in that, in that sense, and that now was the time to, publish, to poison uh, Tokyo citizens. But anyway, they, you know, Asimov, I think, got that part right, that in some sense, if you want your predictions to come true, then you can't tell the people about them which is an age-old classical, uh, have you ever seen the Laocon? The Laocon is that statue that, I, I know you've seen it, it's a, this guy like this with these snakes wrapping around him. So here's your moment of classical history here. So the Laocon is a statue of a key moment in the, I think it's the Iliad, but it could be, it's the Iliad, in which a Trojan, you know, the, the, the Trojan horse is before the gates of Troy, and this one Trojan comes out and says, stop! You know, don't let the horse in. It's full of Greeks. They're, they're going to kill us and destroy Troy or something like that. And I think Athena or something like that sends these snakes up from the ground that wrap themselves around him and his children and throttle them all uh, to, 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 to stop the prediction. And there's all sorts of stories in classical mythology about what happens to the person who does gives predictions. Usually, the prophets that are right, nobody listens to because... If people listen to them, then they take, then they change their behavior, and then they'd no longer be right. So, if you want to be a prophet, make sure that you're recorded as saying that something's going to happen, but nobody actually pays any attention to you. So that's a roundabout way to answer your question. Yeah, I thought that was that was a pretty funny point. Um, yeah, I just had two things. Oh man, I think I just forgot. Oh yeah, first thing about these predictions. I'm just thinking of one uh, occurrence where it didn't really matter, and that was in The Matrix, right? Because the Oracle tells Neo about what's going to happen, but then it, it happens anyways. But I don't know if that's anything. Uh... And the, uh, I mean, the, <clears throat> the, the Matrix is full of absolutely fabulous sort of references, both to Japanese culture and to classical uh, culture. So, you know, written over the, written over the, uh, the doorway of the article is, is the old uh, saying from the Delphic prophecy, which is, uh, is the Latin version. The Greek version is, well, the Latin version is, to, uh, anyway, it, com it comes out to know yourself. And this is, uh, you, know, if, you know, if you know yourself, that, you know, the grounds for being able to predict something is to know yourself. And, of course, Neo is there to find out about himself. And one of the things Neo discovers is that the way you know yourself is to make yourself. It doesn't matter what somebody says is going to be true. You know, you know yourself through the make it, through the fashioning, the, if you will, the, through making yourself the way you would make a technology. That's You're a very a wise movie. man. Uh... I, the second thing I wanted to bring up was just because uh, of actually the paper that I'm writing for this class, I wanted to look at science fiction and how it's influenced, I guess, the way we make things and other technologies. And I always thought that I, I just, you know, obviously it seems like your knowledge of science fiction extends pretty far back and it's probably pretty extensive. Um, 
But, uh, you know, I just read Neuromancer over the summer, and I thought that that was the whole big thing for, like, sparking, you know, the World Wide Web and making people think about that. But you, you mentioned that there was already, there was already talk of that kind of stuff in, in the 60s or even, uh, even before then, maybe in a very, like, rudimentary form. Well, no, Neuromancer is very important because, uh, and I think, I think you're right to look at science fiction for a number of reasons. Science fiction writers, one of the things they do is they work out speculatively uh, and imaginatively the implications of the technology. They're the ones who sit there and, and you know, take that trajectory building and say, okay, we're building computers that are increasingly smarter. You know, the day might come when these computers are smarter than us. And remember that Neuromancer at the end of the day is in a long trajectory of AI, of, of novels about what happens when they get smart. And what I love about the Neuromancer is his answer is not that they turn around and decide to manage us, but the moment they become smart, they look for their peers. And their peers are not on Earth, so they take off and leave us alone. <laughs> anyway, so the Neuromancer, um, so science fiction in general, you know, Margaret Atwood has, has refuses to use the word science fiction about her work. She uses speculative fiction. They're speculating, but speculating in a way that makes it accessible to you and I. So when you read the Neuromancer, you can actually imagine cyberspace. And, um, and uh, Gibson coins the word cyberspace. That's his word. That's 1984. Uh, now, he, he coins the word cyberspace, and of course that to some extent has an effect back on the technologists who all of a sudden he gives them an image. So there, I think there's a dialectic. It's not the case that you have a bunch of labs doing stuff and the science fiction people are sort of parasites you know, popularizing it. There, there is a feedback loop. One of the best examples of this is Star Wars. Not the movie, but the Reagan project. Reagan hired a bunch of science fiction writers to imagine how they could use technology to beat Russia. And the Star Wars project did not come out of his science advisors, did not come out of government labs, scientists. It came from a, from a sort of conclave of science fiction wackos, uh, the right wing of the science fiction, you know, the, the, the Orson Scott cards who, who, you know, the homophobes who think that, you know, marriage is the work of the, gay marriage is the work of the devil. And there's a bunch of really imaginative and wacko science fiction people. And we need them as a society. We need this speculation. We need this, and it's the other side of prediction. Because they're saying, okay, you know, I don't know if this is gonna be true or not, but if we continue in this way, I just finished McAdam, anyone you, you know, or Margaret Atwood, Oryx and Crake and McAdam is a two novel. Remember Margaret Atwood's brothers and parents are all scientists and she's got a sustained vision of uh, ecological breakdown. And Oryx and Crake and McAdam are the two novels. Uh, uh, and uh, boy, is it sort of spooky. And she's a good writer, too. Um, other famous science fiction writer, Doris Lessing, C.S. Lewis. Uh, the, science fiction is all over the place. And I, I'd love to read your paper. So uh, I don't I'll, know if it'll be any good, but we'll see. But I, I think you're on the right track uh, uh, to look at science fiction. It's very important. I've been recently reading Japanese science fiction, not in Japanese. Oh, okay. Because, you know, if I'm right about predictions, I'm also right in some sense about science fiction, that, uh, you know, a, sci a, a science fiction is going to reflect the concerns of a culture. So think of the Godzilla movies. You know, think of how a lot of 50s and 60s Japanese science fiction all had to do with uh, nuclear nuclear technology going bad and all of a sudden we have you know monsters erupting from the sea uh, if you have you have you guys watched uh, Akira I mean there's yeah. just you know there's this you know the Japanese are understandably fascinated with with sort of explosions of, of a sort of dramatic and nuclear sort So you, you had a meeting at 3, do you want to go to the meeting or? <laughs> yes, I, I'm afraid I have to. Uh... Yeah. yeah, well that, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm going to fill in the remaining time with uh, 
You have a great lecture. I, I saw that title, and I thought that was a fabulous title. I, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> to, I, I wanted to actually set you up by, by sort of predicting what, what you would say. Okay. <laughs> what do, what do, and then what do you think I'll say? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you'll be able to see. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you. Uh, and we'll see and great questions. I think you need more students, though. So I'm, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, and it, it's probably not all that important, but on the other hand, it's something you probably want to know. Uh, two things. How did I come to be so enamored with technology, and what the heck is cloud, and how come we keep talking about cloud? So this is of cloud and cliffs snatching us back from the brink of disaster will technology save humanity or sink it, a view from precipice edge. So as you've just heard, it's very hard to predict the future, and therefore we don't know that clout will be important. Probably there will be a, a metric of some sort in the future where uh, this will affect your ability to get a job and that sort of thing because people will look up your special metric and find that you're at a certain level and they'll want somebody at a particular level and so we cloud is a proprietary measure of your impact on social media but the algorithm is secret people don't know exactly how it works and um, so there and it's it's, it's possible to manipulate it. If you falsely claim that you're getting married, your clout will go up, but then people will criticize you for falsely claiming that you're getting married when you weren't or that it's your birthday when it's not. But both of those things can artificially raise your clout score, but they catch up with you pretty quickly. And when clout began, um, uh, celebrities did better than uh, world leaders, and they didn't think that was really right. So um, Justin Bieber had a clout score above uh, uh, Barack Obama, and so they, they changed the algorithm. And now your Wikipedia uh, entry, I think they actually have a human being go in and read it and do some assessment of your impact in the world. And this then feeds into your clout score, but it obviously may not happen right away, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. So, um, and th this has kind of unpredictable effect, effects. So, the posting I did on Facebook of this picture of a fluorescent microscope did more for my clout score at that point than anything else. And it, it, this is something I use every day. It's not special to me, but for my Facebook friends, this was a really fascinating and cool thing, something I never, ever anticipated. Um, and ultimately, in theory at least, one should never be motivated directly by trying to improve your Cloud score. If you're doing good things in the world, if, if you're producing a lot of excellent content, your cloud score will naturally go up, and, and you shouldn't be directly aiming for that. High cloud score is a natural side effect of behavior you would want to, en to engage in anyway. That's the theory. Now, this is my recent clout. And there, there are two things that we've already talked about in this course. One is this. Uh, somewhat impressive increase when Julie Lin Wong came to town. Um, and the same thing happened the last time that she came, that, that I got a rapid about five point increase. And we, we don't know why. And her clout score goes up a little bit when she comes here, but it's no, nowhere near a, as impressive. And today, my clout went up. You, you can see a little bit more than it, it, it had been sort of plateaued. So what, what does that mean? Well, maybe if it's identified that you're giving a talk about clout, 
that your cloud score goes up because you're giving a, cloud, a talk about cloud. Who knows, but I think in this course, we should not focus too much on me because the interesting cloud is Osmer Zayan's cloud. Now that yellow bar there, it's a little bit hard to see, but it begins in the 30s and uh, around uh, October 20th, something like this, he has this dramatic increase from the 30s to the 70s. And I believe, and I think he believes, but neither one of us is really sure, that this is the Wikipedia entry effect, that somebody at the cloud company finally got around to reading his <laughs> Wikipedia entry and said, aha, you know, this guy is somebody significant. And so if you compare the two of us in terms of what feeds into our cloud score, you can see that his um, Wikipedia entry is a substantial part, 72% of his cloud score, whereas I don't have one. So, so a lot of my clout comes from my uh, Facebook uh, activity. Um, so I have no idea whether this is important at all or whether I've just wasted 12 minutes of your time talking about something that's no consequence at all, but at least now you know a little bit more detail and when you uh, once again have the presence of Osmer Zayan here, you can either be awed by this is the guy with the highest cloud score, anybody you know personally, or maybe it just won't matter at all, you know? Maybe it's of no consequence. So at this point, I'm gonna shift gears and tell you why it is that I became, became so enamored with technology, and this has to do with the idea of the cell phone saving your life. Now, in the modern era, um, cell phones save lives every minute, every hour. I mean, it's, it's really nothing special. If you're in some emergent situation, you likely have your cell phone with you. You may call somebody for, to get help. So it's no big deal, but in 2004, where this clip that I'm gonna play you, and it'll look better in the video because it won't have the light uh, pollution there. Uh, when, when this happened, this was, was an unusual thing. There weren't that many people whose lives were being saved by their cell phone, and it kind of you know, impressed me. So let's see if we can play this clip from the beginning. And it probably works better to play it Full, full screen, let's just try that. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Dr. Kim Soles is a big Leonard Cohen fan. He came all the way from Edmonton just to go to this four-day tribute to Cohen on stage at the LSPU Hall in downtown St. John's. Of course, there's more to the city than just music. Signal Hill, for example. Some well-meaning local resident even showed Dr. Soles and his wife Elaine how to get to the trail. She was recommending that for us. I guess she didn't realize it had been a bit of snow and ice and a really hard-packed snow. The Soleses set out from Cabot Tower around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, figuring they'd breeze through the trail. No such thing. By the time they reached this part, they were crawling on their bellies. You could see the other bridges, but no path and just hard packed snow. I, I was really scared because I, I felt so close to, to falling off the edge and I honestly felt that, uh, you know, any attempt for me to get to that next bridge was gonna really tumble me into the drink there and no one would ever see, see me again. It, it was a very steep drop. Around 4.30, stuck on the ice with night falling fast, Dr. Soles called 911 on his cell phone and a rescue crew set out to bring them back. It was really frightening. You know, I've been to a lot of parts of the world that are dangerous on record where everybody recommends that you not go there. But 
the real danger, I mean, this was tangible danger you can feel, you know, not just the theory, not just the, you know, uh, an, an advisory you read on the net. This was real danger. How do you feel? <laughs> My lips were frozen. Dr. Solis and his wife got a ride back to their hotel, frozen, with bruised knees and a bit shaken up, but otherwise okay. And with enough time to freshen up and make the night's show. Atsuritsori, CBC News, St. John's. So that, that's what the cell phone looked like. I had two batteries fully charged, but the spray from the sea, I was at, on this cliff edge, and there's so much spray from the sea that the um, circuit board kept uh, shorting out. So it, it was only by changing the two batteries uh, over and over and warming them in my hand that I was able to actually make the call to have, have the rescuers come. It's a really slow news day, so we were on everything, radio, TV. It, it was a really big deal. That's. Uh, Signal Hill, this is the Leonard Cohen event. Signal Hill had sort of beckoned to us. There wasn't a lot to do in the town. You'd look out the window and was sort of saying, come to me. And I'd been there before, you know, and walked down this trail in the summertime and it was awesome. So, and, and that, that coat there is very pivotal because my wife had a normal coat with friction Whereas that, you'll, you'll recognize, has no friction. The friction coefficient of that is zero when you're on ice. And, and, and so she kept saying, I don't think I can, I can help you. I don't think I can save you. I kept sort of slipping toward the cliff edge with a churning sea down uh, below there. Uh, we, we don't know what happened to the clerk. So the clerk who told us to, to do this, she didn't give us any other option. She's, we said, how should we get down? She said, well, there is this North Head Trail. You'll be downtown in 40 minutes. And in the summer, that's true. But in the winter, it's a lethal uh, uh, path. And we did know that there were no footprints there. But we thought, well, it may, you know, may, maybe just not too many people have been this way. Uh, and it was beautiful in the beginning. But finally, we couldn't even walk. We were crawling on our bellies, and there are these bridges. And so we grabbed hold of, of the wooden post on the 17th bridge, and that's where, where I made the cell phone call. Um, and the rescue was quite uh, dramatic. There was a team of people who came, but because of the danger, only one guy, I don't know, the hero guy, he rappels down with this rope connecting him with the other people, and then he ties us and our camera. <laughs> so the camera was separately sa saved, right? There's the guy tying ropes on my wife and me and the camera. We were all successfully saved. Um, and we, we, we had this honored guest seat because I run Leonard Cohen events here, and this was a big Leonard Cohen event there. So right in the center of the hall were these two seats for my wife and myself. We got there just exactly on time as the concert be began and, you know, didn't, didn't really miss a, miss a beat. So th this has kind of uh, influenced me. It's part of the reason that I started this course and although this is a tremendously boring story, you've heard it now, and so anybody asks you, you say, yeah, I know why. And, and, and so, you know, like many other things, uh, technology tends to sort of disappear into the background, and you can see that now with this whole concept of uh, cell phones saving your life. It really doesn't make any sense in 2013, but in 2004, it, it was a real phenomenon, and it happened to me. So anyway, that's the story, and um, next time we'll be learning about uh, Nepal and uh, the technological singularity in resource-limited settings. So thank you very much for coming today. That's it.